almost like we've been. Oh, doing what's this important is that you look good <laughs> right now. Thanks, Kevin. Look at that suit. You look Black good Hills office. Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly's 10-year anniversary show. I am very excited to be here with our panel of guests that we've brought on via Skype. <clears throat> We're going to talk about bug bounty programs and responsible disclosure. We have with us Katie Mazuris, who is the Chief Policy Officer for Hacker One. We welcome her back to the show, as well as Sammy Kamkar, an independent security researcher Best known, and I apologize for the semi, for creating the MySpace worm. I, that's just how I remember you. <laughs> You've had several... I, I apologize. Is that why he's an independent <laughs> researcher? <Yeah. laughs> Sammy has many accomplishments above and beyond that. But oh, that my, oh my gosh, I'm like a fanboy. So. Yeah, we are fanboys. <laughs> Sammy. Many more, many more accomplishments. Wait, are you my hero? You we totally <laughs> kill a toddler. Well, daughter, you know, right Sammy now. is our hero. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we also have with us Casey Ellis, CEO and co-founder of Bug Crowd. Thank you all Hello. for joining us today. Uh, I'm glad you could be here to talk about this topic. You are all certainly experts in it, and I'm excited to get down into it. And I want to start by asking all of you how responsible disclosure has changed over the years. Uh, number one, can you hear me? We can yes. hear you. Hi, Katie. How are you? Uh, Hello. Number one, let's please stop calling it responsible. Like, seriously. <laughs> I, did, I did that on purpose just out. for you, Katie. There so are you quotes could around responsible. <laughs> That's in right. No, no, no. Wait, wait. Uh, well. Why, Katie? Why? Yeah. Why? Okay, so uh, one, defining the term responsible is is irresponsible. One should not try and do that. Um, no, it's, it's, it's just a morally loaded term. It doesn't do anything to forward the conversation, and it's better to use a more descriptive term like coordinated because you're coordinating the disclosure as opposed to you know assigning any moral judgments to what you're doing with the bug or what you're doing on the vendor side or what you're doing on the finder side, et cetera. It just doesn't add to the conversation. That's fantastic. I think we should call it profitable disclosure from now on. <laughs> profitable disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's where we need to be because that's at least honest and true. So, uh, Sammy, For some. Sammy, uh, yeah. responsible or coordinated? Speaking from someone who's maybe had, uh, you know, I, I think I, I've I've never even thought about it for a moment. But I think Katie makes a great point. Um, you know, I don't think I, there are different different levels of responsibility for different types of vulnerabilities, um, different right. ways to communicate it based on who you're talking to, which vendor, uh, who's affected, how they're affected, how quickly they'll be affected. Um, so I think that's a that's a totally valid point and legitimate. Casey, um, are we just so beating, yeah, are we be beating cool. a dead horse name. here? So Katie, I think we should, yeah, no, I'm the I'm the voice. Yeah, let's let's just make it let's make up a new name. I'm the voice of dissent on this one a little bit. This responsibility is is plenty descriptive as a term. It's about you know, if you make an action, you're responsible for the result of that action. I think the problem with that word is that it's sort of been used to apply the fact that hackers are irresponsible and it's been kind of used like that over the years and, and that there's a plenty big hangover from that. But um, when we still use that term or when I still use that term, you know, the thing that I try to push is the fact that the vendors have to be responsible for following through on what they commit to as well. So it's an interesting one. I mean, coordinated, I think, is more technically accurate, but I think it's also potentially more confusing to people that are new to this concept as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this next question I get from a lot of people, um, from close personal friends to people who listen to the show, who write in, that just want guidance on. Uh, and uh, so my question is, what advice do you have for someone who's discovered a vulnerability and doesn't know the proper way to disclose it. They've, they've never gone through the disclosure process in any way, shape, form, or fashion. What advice do you have for that person? Just DM me. Take me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, have so a zero day, well just DM played. Sammy. And yeah, DM me on it. Twitter. <laughs> well take, a deep, take a deep breath first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, looking, looking, for the, looking for the typical contact points the companies have is always the best place to start. And I think... Um, yeah, if researchers are finding things, oftentimes, like it's, I think it's rare that they don't know how to do that in the normal ways when they first start out. So pointing them in that direction is always a good thing. Yeah, there's a, there are a number of different, you know, available directories of how to get, you know, get in touch with vendors. 
they're not all, you know, um, completely accurate, you know, because a lot of vendors don't even have a point of contact. Okay. Um, but generally speaking, you know, there's um, the Open Security Foundation has a directory, uh, Bugcrowd has a directory, HackerOne has a directory. So there's a number of different resources that are out there for you at least to start. Um, other than that, trying security at, you know, company.com usually yep. gets to somebody. And if it doesn't, you know, cycle through support at, you know, sales at, just keep going, um, you know, until you run out of steam and then, you know, maybe bring in uh, a CERT coordination center like CERT CC um, might be able to help you and give you contact info as well. So what, what, if I, what, if, no, what if I really fear legal action? What if I'm afraid that when I contact the company that there might be repercussions? Does that happen less or more or does it depend on the company and the type of bug you've disclosed or are about to disclose? I think it depends on the company, but if you're really afraid of it, go through CERT CC because they have, uh, or at least in the United States, go through CERT CC. They have processes where they will keep the uh, researcher anonymous mm -hmm. um, in reporting the vulnerability. And, and what, what is CERT CC, Katie? Um, it is the Computer Emergency Response Team Coordination Center. It's mm -hmm. part of the Department of Homeland Security, um, you know, under that umbrella. But they've been around well before the Department of Homeland Security has been uh, involved. And actually, the co-editor of the ISO standard on vulnerability disclosure, Art Mannion, um, you know, is co-editor of that standard with me. And so, anyway, they've they've been doing disclosure for a very, very long time. Mm. So I got a question. Um, you, you can also... Hold you, on. Go ahead, you could also try reaching out to uh, the uh, the EFF. Um, they've been pretty helpful for me for the last year and mm -hmm. guiding me on, on some of my research. So uh, if you have some research, they're also very helpful. Uh, a team of nonprofit uh, attorneys that I think are open to vulnerability research and Twitter's rights. Go ahead. So, so I got a question. If you're a company and you decide that you want to have a coordinated or responsible disclosure program, however you want to name it, uh, what resources are available for companies to actually start standing this up? Is it something that you can subcontract out? Can you go through a third party? Can we point at one of your organizations, organizations that you know of, so that they can work with a third party organization to handle that brokering and vetting before it actually gets to the company? Is there anything like that? Or are pretty much all companies and people that are trying to find bugs out there for these bug bounty programs kind of on their own right now? There's a big, um, that's a big chunk of, of what we actually do here. I mean, apart from building the platform out, we've got a team in-house that uh, what, it, what it does is really handles that initial interaction with the researchers and makes sure that, um, you know, that's being handled well for starters. But then also, you know, I think one of the things that's happened is this whole disclosure and, and bug bounty thing has taken off. The, uh, the signal or the amount of noise as well as the amount of signal has, has risen, right? So for organizations that, that have teams of any size, you know, there's a burden uh, and, and being able to outsource that, you know, for some makes sense, not necessarily everyone. Some can afford to do it in-house and if that's the case, then they should certainly do that because being, you know, as close to this process as possible is also a useful thing. Yeah, I would say, you know, there are a number of different models that you can use. You can yeah. use, you know, a services model like, you know, like Casey has at BugCrowd. You can also use, um, you know, platform and tools model that we have at HackerOne um, where we've got, we actually um, use the reputation system that's built into the platform to help with the signal to noise issue. We've got like three times the signal across our platform than Google does with its program and Google has runs a really good program in-house themselves. Um, so we've had good results there and and then um, I also released a maturity model a couple of weeks ago that can help organizations that want to start doing vuln disclosure and vuln coordination with the hacker community. It helps them kind of do a self-assessment baseline and see where they are in certain capability areas, see where they need to improve, and then uh, talks them through, you know, essentially what do they need to do to get to the more advanced stages and what kind of incentives, you know, go along with those advanced stages of being able to handle bugs. And where could people find that? Um, HackerOne.com, uh, you know, has on our blog, we have uh, the, the entry um, that talks about all the different resources. So there's actually um, slides that describe the maturity model. Um, there's a survey that people can take and get their maturity model baseline, you know, sent to them with recommendations on how to improve. And, uh, and then I have like a 10 minute or a seven minute video on YouTube and it's all linked from the blog on HackerOne.com. I also see a lot of companies that are trying to stand up these vulnerability disclosure programs, setting up bug bounty programs. And one of the things that I see them try to do initially off the start is try to get people that come to them 
and say, I found a vulnerability in your website, I found a vulnerability in your platform, I found a vulnerability in your product, to start by, they try to treat it as though they're a standard pen testing company. They say, well, step one, we want you to sign this non-disclosure agreement with your real name, your address, and, and everything. Yeah. How does that usually work out, just for people that are listening and dialing in? If that's, if that's how they're responding to, <clears throat> I mean, we, we do that for companies but they engage proactively and that works quite well. I think trying to do that on a reactive basis when someone's coming to you with a vulnerability, that's going to be really tricky because at that point you've already got someone who's, you know, they, they've done their work, they've got, you know, some of the, the, the fear and trepidation that we spoke about before, like how's this going to go down and all that kind of stuff. Like the minute you start involving lawyers and NDAs, at that stage of the conversation, it's, it's adding a whole bunch of, you know, bad vibes for, for want of a better word to, yeah. uh, to try to get it all figured out. Uh, well, and I you're would personally never sign that. And yeah. Very cool. Yeah. You're, you're essentially turning away the researchers before they've even had a chance to exactly. give you the information, exactly. um, turning them away, turning them off and having them tell their friends not to come to you in the future because that's what they <laughs> can expect. So it's, it's got like a ripple effect of badness when you start involving lawyers like that. Yeah. So, but what, what's changed over time that, you know, I, I feel like years ago, a lot of companies were like, well, I don't, you know, if you found bugs, I don't really want you to do that. I don't really want you to tell me about them. If you tell me, I'm going to sue you. I feel like the climate has changed so much so that companies are now ado adopting bug bounty programs and like, yeah, go find vulnerabilities and we'll pay you yeah. if you find them. Like, what's changed to, to make that shift in a lot of these companies? A big, a big piece of it from... <clears throat> from our from our end of things is just you know it ties in with the fact that there's not enough people to do this in the first place, right? So it's actually a response to to the resource shortage that the security industry has. They're like, okay, we've got this this pool of people, this crowd of available researchers that you know they're at the table, they're willing and they're they're ready to help us. Um, cool, let's set these things up to actually engage that and and maybe start to look at that as a way to augment. Uh, you know the ability that we have to hire people in house or hire people as contractors. So that's <clears throat> that's one side of it, and the other side is it, it's just taking off. Like the, the 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 noise around this idea, it's it's obviously a very loud thing when it happens. Like bug bounties, I think <clears throat> by nature are kind of inherently viral. People still like to talk about them and all those sorts of things. And the more that happens, the more awareness it gains, and the more people jump in and say, "Yeah, I want to give it a shot." Mm. Yeah, I think um, I, have a, I have a number of friends. So, go right, ahead. Sammy, Sammy no, no, Katie. Sammy, go. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have a number of friends who do Vuln research as well. And, you know, if there's a company that doesn't have a bug bounty program, they're going to release it a different way, right? They may not even disclose it to that company at all. They might do full disclosure, um, which may or may not make sense. Uh, or who knows? Like, there are some people who, who will happily sell it on the black market, but if they have a, a nicer way to do that, then they'll, they'll do that if, if there is a bounty program. Uh, in place, where otherwise, you know, uh, as Casey said, right, it's very loud and it it's hitting a lot of people right now, right? It's, companies left and right are getting massively breached, leaks every single day. So I think it's also a positive way to avoid that as much as possible. Yeah, and I, w I would add to that that, you know, I, I've done vulnerability coordination for probably like the past 15 years. And I can tell you how it's changed is more and more organizations are going through what I call the five stages of vulnerability response grief and getting to the acceptance <laughs> stage, you know, <laughs> like that, that first stage was denial. It's like, no, we use HTTPS, yeah. We're totally secure. There's a little lock up there. It's yeah, right. yeah. Totally you know? secure way to get hacked. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, they're completely in denial. And then they're, you know, then they realize and they get angry and that's when they send the lawyers and everything and try and crush the researcher and just say, you know, um, the cease and desist letters come and everything. And then, you know, they start bargaining. They're like, well, would you maybe not release an exploit? Like, would maybe <laughs> yeah. this only be theoretically exploitable like how what, what are we bargaining with here and then when they realize the gravity of their situation the fact that they're you know all their code contains bugs and there's yeah. no escaping that reality then they get really depressed really very sad 
And um, once they kind of get out of that trough, they can they can start focusing their energy on hiring hackers and, you know, enjoying the fact that not only, you know, can they bring really smart security people in-house, but they can take advantage of this global cybersecurity community of hackers worldwide yep. that are willing to step up and help. Um, some of them are still willing to step, step up and help without a bug bounty, but others who want, you know, who want that, there are more and more defensive options for them to sell their work um, in bug bounty programs, et cetera. So I think I think it's caught a lot more mainstream, you know, obviously since Microsoft started doing it, you know, a couple of years ago when I used to work there and I launched those programs that really took it into, you know, this much more mainstream um, avenue where people could envision themselves, even big older corporations with massive, you know, um, deployments of multiple versions of software, hardware, services, everything, you figure out that you don't actually have to do it all at once. You yeah. can ease your way in. There are ways to start small and get bigger. I mean, HackerOne has invitation-only programs, you know, that we can, that, that we help people get ramped up, you know, in enhancing their capabilities of being able to handle vulnerabilities in the first place. But also, you know, the platform makes it super easy and less complicated to pay them. That was one of the biggest headaches that I had at Microsoft was figuring out how to pay a researcher in, you know, who knows where Russia, right? You know, there's no Western Union. Is it Eastern Union? Like, what do you do? You know, and everything. <laughs> Bitcoin. Um, Distribution. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, yeah, hacker one does pay in Bitcoin as well, so yes. So kind of heading it, kind of in that note, our, our organizations today, whenever you have security researchers, I don't want to call them hackers because a lot of companies that are in the first two stages, they like to call them hackers and they think that they're being illegal. But usually if somebody comes to you and honestly says, hey, I found this vulnerability, I'd like to get paid for it, I found by and large that they're actually pretty good people to work with, generally, by and large. Are organizations facing a fleet of 100 trained flying monkeys that are doing this? Or do you guys see these bug bounty programs and the security researchers that are behind them that you're looking at a small group of very elite, very good people? What are we looking at? Are we looking at massive numbers of people trying constantly? Or are we looking at very small numbers of very, very, very good people that are working through bug bounty programs? There's a huge spread. I think, mm -hmm. you know, the, the answer is yes, <laughs> basically. Um, I think since what we've seen is since this whole idea has taken off, there's a lot of people um, coming into bug bounty hunting from, from a QA background. So they're starting to focus, focus up their QA experience onto security style testing. Uh, and, and that's probably representative of the, the hordes of hundreds that you spoke about before. Um, but then, you know, you've got these different kind of levels of creativity that they can apply to, to this whole, you know, area of finding a vulnerability and exploiting it. Uh, and then at, at the top, you do have, you know, these folks that can, that can deliver quite a high impact. There's, there's kind of, you know, the way you think of it is almost like a triangle of, of skill, right? You've got these folks down the bottom who have a low level of creativity, but there's lots of them. And then you've got folks at the high end that have a, a very, you know, advanced level of creativity, but there's, there's fewer of them, obviously. Kind of like with cross-site scripting, there's one guy, I don't know if you guys have come across him, Dimok, I think is his name. Um, we've had a number of customers, I guess he found a couple of novel ways of doing cross-site scripting, uh, scripting attacks, scripting, Jesus, uh, scripting attacks, and he nailed like a whole bunch of organizations and then approached yeah. them from a bug bounty prop. So he's hitting a lot of people, but he found a novel way of approaching it to bypass web application firewalls. So I see yeah. that type of thing happening quite regularly. But I also, like you said, there's tons and tons and tons of people that find just kind of low-hanging fruit on yeah. websites all the time. Or, or stuff that's not useful at all. Like I think the, the challenge, one of the challenges with all of this has been like with, with this group of researchers that's, that's growing, you've almost got the secondary group of people that, you know, it's, it's, we refer to it as the beg, the beg bounty or the nag bounty hunter. Like they're, they're more about getting in there and, and basically just harassing people into, into paying them or putting them up on a wall of fame. And usually they're not even finding stuff. They're just throwing crap at the wall and seeing if they can get paid for it. They're so. finding, yeah. finding clickjacking is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but to be honest, I, I think for a lot of the ones <laughs> that actually on get Sammy's elevated, <laughs> a lot of times they're kind of the minority. A lot of the people that I've worked with in our customers, they're usually pretty professional in the way that they handle it. They're not complete oh, yeah, jerks absolutely. all the time. Well, along yeah, those lines, the, how, do you, uh, how do you get around the issues of not violating people's policies or agreements that says, you know, like, obviously Facebook doesn't shall want not hack. the world to hack into their website, but they have a bug bounty program. Like, how, do these, how are these bug bounty programs um, uh, defined, and what do 
uh, people who are participating in these bug bounty programs, like what can they do to stay within the guidelines uh, of these programs and not violate CFAA or uh, violate their uh, ISPs agreements or violate all these people's agreements? Because, I mean, they are finding vulnerabilities. So how do you do that safely within the confines of a bug bounty program? Well, I think you uh, can stay within the terms of some of the some of the existing bug bounty programs. I don't know about the CFAA or any other <laughs> any other things outside of their terms. But a couple, but a lot of these companies, and I'm sure these guys can speak to that better. You know, have really good terms when it comes to their bug bounty program. And you know, as long as you're not manipulating other people's data, um, downloading yeah. other people's data, uh, you know, attempting to DOS the uh, the machines, then you're okay. Mm -hmm. As long as you also perform. Disclosure? Are we calling it again? What's the new name? Coordinated. Coordinated. Coordinated disclosure. Coordinated. I, Coordinated. Yeah. I really, Coordinated liked, disclosure, I really yeah. liked profitable disclosure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did too. How about coordinated <laughs> and profitable yeah. disclosure? <laughs> so um, what, what companies... Well, oh, hold the, on, okay, go, go from ahead. The, so first of all, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, the C I have asked lawyers about bug bounty programs and what kind of protection it offers um, for researchers under CFAA um, and not violating CFAA. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's it, there's the criminal statute, which um, a bug bounty program is not actually a protection from potentially Department of Justice going after somebody um, for violating the criminal statute CFAA. So while a company could say, you know, we will not bring legal action against you, and I when I started working at Microsoft, that was the first thing I, I helped push out the door was the statement, very clear statement, that we will not pursue legal action if you give us a chance to fix a vulnerability in our online services, because that's really where the CFAA comes into play, is when you're attacking systems or testing systems that don't belong to you, right? If you're reverse engineering, you know, um, uh, office on your own machine, that's different. That's not necessarily going to be a CFAA violation because you're not attacking somebody else's servers. But for the online services stuff, um, there's still the potential for a researcher to get in trouble with the Department of Justice, even yeah. if the vendor company is open to them coming forward. So the best advice I can give, again, not being a lawyer, not even a little bit, um, is follow the terms that are uh, set forth in the uh, in the, the disclosure guidelines of the either Vuln Disclosure Program or Bug Bounty Program, and usually they will be very straightforward. No DOS, like Sammy was saying, but also do not intentionally violate the privacy of other users, yeah. because essentially you can't especially for a bug bounty, you can't necessarily pay people who repeatedly violate the privacy of the other users in your, you know, on your online service. That's, that's going to be bad business for you overall. Your users aren't going to be able to trust that their privacy is not being, you know, put out for, for, you know, essentially out for auction to the, the hacker community. So you do have to maintain certain lines, you know, when you're a vendor and, and defining your no-fly zones. But from a researcher perspective, yeah, you can still get, technically you can still get prosecuted under CFAA. Yeah, and the, the workaround or the semi-workaround, and I'm also not a lawyer, but um, that, that came up when we, we put out basically an open, open source <laughs> responsible disclosure policy for people to throw up. Um, <clears throat> that came up. The DOJ can still pursue a criminal criminal case, even if there is like civil safe harbor given by the program. Right? Um, what a what an organization can do is they can they can basically make a good faith commitment not to assist as best as possible. Obviously, that's not always realistic, but you know that's as good as it can get. So, from the researcher's perspective, it's you know understand the laws that you're operating in as best you can. Um, follow the rules that are set out. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> but then also consider the fact that these companies, like they still need the ability to criminally pursue uh, or, or to pursue legally people that do hack them for real, right? So while they're saying, yes, we are opening our stuff up for research, we do still need to be able to go after people that we think pursue and like pose an actual threat to us. So it's, it's just, you know, it's empathy on both sides to some extent, which is not always an easy proposition, but I think that goes a long way to, to getting it right. What are some of the other components to having a really successful bug bounty program? Um, you know, the ability to do triage and actually, you know, remediate the vulnerabilities in a reasonable amount of time yep. makes a big difference. You know, if you're, if you're, Sitting on the bugs, even if you paid somebody, that researcher came forward not probably not just for the money because if it was just for the money, they would have probably tried to sell it on a different market than than the defensive market. So time to fix is a really important element, I would say. 
Yeah, I think aligning the expectations. I mean, <clears throat> this is this is one of the things that we set up as uh, we call it the golden rule. It's like aligning align the expectations between the researcher and the company before things kick off. Um, so if a company is going out and saying, okay, here's the scope, here's what we're going to offer, here's what we're going to do, and here's our terms. Once those things have been set out, you know, it's it's on the company to make sure that they stick to those terms and there's integrity in that relationship. And then the same goes for the researcher side as well. But but then I think the other piece is just making sure that it's as transparent as it can possibly be. You know, the the other the other kind of rule that we throw out there or guideline that we throw out there is if you touch the code, then you should pay the researcher for it because at that point you've received value. Um, and, and what you've entered into is, is this arrangement where you're going to pay for when you receive value. You know, that's not always simple and black and white, but having that as a guided principle for how you approach things, I think you're off to a really good start. So what can you do as a uh, security researcher, because Santa Cangelo is not here and Sammy's going to get a kick <laughs> out of that one. Uh, when you're a security researcher, you find a bug, it goes into a bug bounty program, you get paid, but they don't fix it. I mean, do, what is the? I mean, do you just ride off in the sunset and not worry about it? Like, because I got paid, so why should I worry about it? But as a security professional, I kind of I have this moral ethical thing that I want to see this vulnerability get fixed. We all have that in us, right? We've all talked about that on the show. Like, we want to see things get fixed. But now this bug bounty program set up that I get paid. Well, I got paid, but me getting paid and the bug getting fixed are two almost mutually exclusive things yeah. but we want to see things yeah, yeah totally we want to see things get fixed so how do we how do we solve that problem because there is profitability to be had that is independent of I the bug being I fixed I love this question so, <laughs> well, I, I have a I, I, I have think, an answer uh, but go for it Sammy <laughs> <laughs> Well I mean I, I think I think we've seen time and time again how you know if this disclosure if that disclosure does not become public one way or another uh, Assuming the the company, you know, as you said, didn't internally resolve it after some reasonable amount of time, then I think it should go public. It, that'll, if it's actually affecting consumers in, in a negative way, you'll actually you will make change. It will affect that company. They will do whatever it takes to fix that, because for the most part, a lot of these vulnerabilities, and as we keep seeing, especially with all these all these, um, you know, the recent leaks, we saw a bunch of O days get dropped. Mm -hmm. Right? How many O days came out of just some of the what the hacking team leak? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, but a lot. <laughs> and Actually, there weren't companies. that many. There were not that many O days. That's kind of an important uh, point. How many, if we're how many about people? Later, but well, yeah. How many on. people were affected? Okay, so so let's talk about how many machines were affected from those O days. Impact. Yeah. Yeah, but it was what for every every Microsoft Windows machine, every Flash machine, every machine with Flash. I mean, we're talking about virtually every up-to-date computer in the world. Is that correct? Well. Not so it's it, maybe it's not maybe it's right? not a lot but, of yeah. Hey hey hey, we're just counting yeah, two I mean, different these things in two different them. ways. You're both right, and we love you both dearly. That was Katie's answer. I'm just well, saying the hell out of this. Well, uh, so. not, yeah. <laughs> So, what was Katie's so, I mean, yeah, yeah, answer? My answer, answer was there wasn't very many as far as raw number. And then I think oh, Sam no, no. said, well, she has an answer, to, she has an answer to the question. Yeah, yeah Katie so has an answer, answer to the question. To the, Go ahead, the Katie. question, right? So let's, let's take a real-world example of probably uh, one of the largest individual bounties paid out uh, and then disclosed for uh, essentially not fixing the issue. That would be a $100,000 mitigation bypass bounty that went to the research team over at ZDI. And they worked, they coordinated even the disclosure of that um, with Microsoft. So essentially, they reported a brand new mitigation bypass technique that's not a zero day per se, that's not an exploit per se, but that is a new technique. So think about, you know, the new ROP, right? The new return oriented programming. It was one of those. Um, so fairly rare. They got $100,000 for that. They got a $25,000 bonus for offering a defense idea, a mitigation idea for that attack. Um, they considered it very carefully. And the answer to this question is consider it very carefully. And essentially, the way that pe reasonable people are going to disagree on the best way to minimize risk. But I absolutely agree with Sammy when it's, you know, when it's a matter of company is not going to fix it. They have declared to you that they're not going to. Then you need to make an assessment yourself as to what is the best way I can help the public mitigate this risk. And so for, for ZDI, they had a very thoughtful blog post. They coordinated that the disclosure of the issue and the blog post with Microsoft. So it wasn't like a, we're going to drop this in anger kind of thing. This was a very calculated and sort of risk aware 
disclosure. And that to me is kind of the pinnacle of an example. And that was a hundred thousand dollar bounty. Mm. So if you think about it in terms of, uh, you know, when we were talking earlier about, you know, handing someone an NDA, if they, if they come forward, can you imagine the conversations I was having with the lawyers at Microsoft when they were like, so they're going to sign an NDA and an IP agreement and all that stuff, or we're not going to give them $100,000 with no NDA, right? And I was like, yes, we are. Oh, yes, we are. <laughs> In fact, we are. And they keep all the IP as well. And they're like, what? You said what now? What? <laughs> and, and, and this is one of the reasons I, one, only one of the reasons I love Katie. <laughs> but, but there has to be a difference but, between there's, there's, uh, um, there's a, a fix available theoretically or whatever, or there's a fix available, but it's deemed to be too costly or mm. there's, there's no known fix available. How does um, that, that in, in that case, in that case, it was architectural level issues that would break too many applications to apply the fix anytime soon. No plans to fix it in the next version or the next version. So that was the conversation. And, you know, essentially ZDI made the risk assessment call um, and, 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 you know, did it very thoughtfully. And that was their decision. And, and I think they, they executed that so gracefully that that was, you know, graceful disclosure. Can we just have a different term then? Another term. Oh, well, Excellent. I love it. I love it. I love it. What was the reasonable time that they, they waited to, to do their responsible disclosure? They actually, they did wait past their own, you know, uh, deadlines um, and everything because they were still in coordinated conversation with Microsoft. They actually blogged the entire, you know, the entire thing. It's a, it's a great blog. It's by Dustin Childs, who used to be uh, at Microsoft, and then he had moved over to HP um, to, to work to at stick DDI. It to your so, former employer. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, yeah. it was it was one of those things where it's like, you know, you you know how how it works on one side, and you're actually able to to engage with that that empathy that Casey was talking about earlier, right? You know, you've already got the empathy built. You know that you're both actually trying to protect the end user, but you know, you just have different realities that you have to deal with. And it's like a no harm, no foul kind of, well, we did this disclosure. Yep. That happened, you know? So let me rephrase the question. I, I Katie, What's, what is an idea of the reasonable Katie, amount of time to, to wait before moving forward with, the, with the disclosure? Are we talking days, weeks, months? Yeah. It depends. It depends on if it's hosted code it's or like installed code. code. There's, a, there's a bunch of different variables that come into that. So I wrote Microsoft's coordinated vulnerable disclosure policy, and there was a specific, you know, and I founded Microsoft Vulnerability Research where we were looking for vulns in third-party products, and we were going to start releasing advisories on third-party products to Microsoft customers. So we actually had to define um, what, what would trigger Microsoft to release um, information about an unpatched vulnerability, and it's in the it's in the vuln disclosure policy that I wrote for them. It's still there, and it's essentially uh, evidence of active exploitation was the trigger for Microsoft, and that was Microsoft's you know kind of gauge of what. <laughs> sorry, what sorry, Larry, Katie. Larry just <laughs> Larry, Larry's Larry. chair just broke. Even <laughs> I'm sorry. Whoa. Even though <laughs> it was your, <laughs> even though Larry was sitting, sorry. he fell. <laughs> your point was awesome. Just Larry about <laughs> fell on his ass. Larry was so, just floored. <laughs> By your, your response. Forward by your response. <laughs> well, that is, that is, literally I would, and figuratively. I would say he was stunned by your beauty and floored by your response, Katie. <laughs> <There> you <laughs> <go>. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, my oh okay. Sorry. Continue. Continue. <laughs> it was sorry, awesome. Katie. That was... No, the, the punchline here is everybody's got a different threshold. It really does depend. Um, Google's threshold is if they think that someone else might know about the vulnerability is their threshold, and they will disclose within seven days or even sooner. Um, you know, if they think somebody else knows about it. Microsoft's was different in that they need to actually see evidence of active exploitation, and they might do that through their own telemetry or with partners. Um, but essentially, you know. Those are the thresholds, you know, that two major companies that that tend to have a couple of disagreements about disclosure once in a while. I don't know what happens, um, but but those are some examples of how those companies handle it. So why, uh, Casey? I'm sorry. Were you going to say something? I know. Nah, I haven't nah, given man, you the floor. I, we, and, okay, I want to make sure you. you I think we've covered all of it. Okay. Good. So now, uh, in, in, excuse me, if, if Adobe and Oracle do you have bug bounty programs? Um, uh, you know, Oracle definitely does not, correct? Yeah, I was going to say. So my point there is not every large comp software company has a bug bounty program. 
What are some of the reasons why these larger companies don't have them? They seem to be very successful. They're taking off lately. Uh, why don't some of these companies have them? Adobe can't afford it. Right. Everyone was saying Microsoft could never afford it. Um, I think it's uh, well, I think it's it's a number of different reasons for different organizations. It a lot of it depends on their maturity levels, right? Like what I was talking about earlier, what are their capabilities for handling the bugs they're already getting? Right. Um, and then another bit is, do they even have an idea? Have they kind of taken a look at themselves and figured out like what's going to what's going to benefit our customers in the best way? Like if we're if we're gradually starting to open up to bug bounty programs, what do we actually want to buy? You know, there's the the usual online services bugs. But what if there's some other product or what what's going to keep them up at night? as a disaster, you know, if it happens, if it's exploited. And they have to kind of start thinking about that in terms of targeting, you know, an initial bug bounty. Yeah, so. I think it, there's, there's, two, there's two key things there. One is, like, how are they going to integrate the operational cost of, of fixing all these issues, right? Because you start one of these programs, you learn a bunch of new stuff in a pretty short space of time, and an organization has to have a fairly mature fixed component to their SDLC to even be able to take that in. And like the more software they've got out, the more products they've got, you know, the, the bigger an undertaking that potentially is. You know, Katie mentioned before, we do the same thing as well, like starting small and ramping up is one way to get around that, but it is a, a blocker, I, I think, in, in the minds of the large software companies. But the other one is that, you know, there's this sort of still fairly pervasive mindset that hackers are scary people that hunch over their laptops with black balaclavas and if you start one of these programs you're going to have all of these you know nefarious types rocking up at your door and trying to extort you and different things like that and that's so that's mostly a then. perception sorry yeah it's it's mostly a perception issue that tends to exist at the exec level like people that that are you know working in security teams like they're listening to conversations like this they're getting they're getting with the program in terms of how this all works and they know that that's not true but at some point, they got to get buy-in from an exec who might still be afraid of hackers. So I think Casey's getting to my the, the thing that was going through my head, and that was, what is their ratio of employees to lawyers? That was the first thing that occurred to me. <laughs> yeah. That really affects this issue directly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there was a blog, there was a you know a recent blog post that won't be mentioned that I think kind of pointed to some of that going on as well. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I got a question. We've mentioned a lot of companies. You've talked about Microsoft and Google, Adobe, kind of. We briefly skirted across Oracle, which I think we should come back to. Mm, um, sure. But are there any companies that you guys look at and you say they're doing it right? If a company is going to try and stand up a bug bounty program, as you know, with anything in corporate America or any corporation around the world, they don't like to be the first. They like to find somebody else that did it, and they like to follow that company and not try to be the one that's trying to blaze the uh, trail on their own. So what companies would you guys recommend if somebody's listening to this and they want to start up a program and you would say, hey, go look at what these guys are doing because we believe that they're doing it right? Well, um, I – oh, go ahead, Casey. Go. Nice. Ladies okay. first. Dead All right. Air. Well, uh, <laughs> so I was going to say, you know, looking at, looking at the way that Microsoft eased its way in is probably a really good model for organizations that aren't sure about how, you know, how they might start tackling this, program, you know, th this, this issue. Um, over 200,000 non-spam email messages a year were coming into security, uh, secure at Microsoft.com. Um, and that was before the bug bounty. So you can imagine if a company that's dealing at that level of volume of non-spam issues coming in and people attempting to report vulnerabilities and all of the resources they have to bring to bear, if they can figure out how to ease into bug bounties, anyone can. Yeah. So I'd, I'd point to them as an example of like how to how to start eating that elephant, you know. Yeah. And then you know anybody else who has you know essentially decided to integrate um, the security research community, the hacker community into their overall like army of defense from the beginning is another great way. So like really small startups who just decide from the get go, you know what? We know we're not perfect and we're going to have bugs in our code. Let's go ahead and start a whole disclosure program, get the hang of it, build some capabilities, and then let's just open it up for bounties. Um, yeah. Those are two like different angles at the same problem, but you can definitely definitely make it work with either of those. Yeah, I think there's the 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 tricky part to answering that question is the organizations like we we deal we deal with a bunch in here and if I was, you know, able to remove any bias, I'd say that Bug Crowd does a pretty good job of that to so look at us, but obviously I'd say that anyway. 
Um, the 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 uh, you know the yeah, but the you're kind of an intermediary though, at Bug Crowd. You're kind of an intermediary. You're not like but a corporation all... that's trying to stand this up. You yeah, know, correct. You're you're exactly. an intermediary. So what you could say is they could use us as that kind of intermediary between the bug bounty people and like the company could say go talk to these guys because they handle it <laughs> yeah, all. Yeah, absolutely. Us. So where I was going to go with that was the, the this whole thing of like the companies that I think are doing it really well that are in the more traditional. So you got kind of you know. Your Facebooks and your Googles and your kind of crazy Bay Area tech companies down this end that are amazing and leading the charge, um, but are also you know not necessarily all that relevant to someone sitting in an office at J.P. Morgan or, or whatever, right? Um, the companies that are more up towards the traditional end of the spectrum, like you're not going to know about them doing it well for for a little while yet because they're doing it privately, like they're starting off quietly, they're getting into this whole. You know, routine of okay, cool. We've got this resource pool that we've got access to. They're at the table. We want to use them. We don't want to throw the gates open because we're not comfortable that we can handle that yet. We're not comfortable about what we'll find. So let's start off quietly. Like that is happening. It's just not happening in a way that I think is. Yeah, you, know, you can you compare the amount of noise that the Facebook program makes, for example, or the Microsoft program, or or any of the ones that are public versus that. Like it can look like this is the only thing that's happening in the market right now, but it's not. So now, um, bug bounty programs, and I know this is a very difficult thing to measure. Do you believe that it has impacted the number of exploits that are being sold in the black market and brought those into bug bounty programs? Like, does anyone on the panel have any idea of the positive impact that bug bounty programs are having? I know Katie will jump in on this one, but I'll, I'll preempt her a little bit and say I definitely think the Microsoft one uh, had, had a big impact on that. Like, the exploit trade around... Yeah, the, the offensive exploit trade around bugs in hosted code. So like, you know, you're going off, off, off after a hosted target as opposed to something that someone would install. It's a very different market and it's, mm -hmm. it really almost doesn't exist. Um, it is there, but it's it's very small. Um, mostly because of the time to live and the value yeah. of the bugs, right? You patch it in one place and it's gone as opposed to, you know, a, a Microsoft O-Day that turns into old day and, and can continue to be <laughs> Operationally, uh, okay. I love that. We've got a lot of new terms. Old day to old day. We've got a lot of new terms yeah. that came out of this panel. It's great. Damn it. And I have so many domain names to register. <laughs> <laughs> I've only registered two during the show. It's a graceful O day. Yeah, we do have a bad habit of, of registering new domains during this show. <laughs> anyway, it's a sweet, so, it's a sweet Sa stuff. so Sammy, from, from your perspective, I think you mentioned before yeah. that there was a, you know, you could you see all the difference between people selling them on the, the black market versus uh, legitimate bug bounties. Like, what's your opinion? on how yeah. they've impacted it you know I, I have no idea you know I have no idea how it's, how it's actually impacted it but I have friends who uh, a lot of my friends will only go to uh, the existing bug bounty programs run by the actual companies affected I know a few people who go to the black market and I know that a number of those people are actually doing the actual bug bounty programs now that, now that there's one available um, yep. yeah. and that it, it doesn't necessarily even mean that, uh, you know, I know some people who won't even attack a system um, if they don't have a bug bounty program, but they do it, you know, as we said earlier, they're going to do it anyway, just kind of if they're on the site, they might just poke around a little bit. And if they find something, what are they supposed to do with that? Uh, if, you know, the, they don't know really what happens on the, on the other side when it goes to the black market, then they might sell it there unless there's an, an easier way um, for them to monetize or you know get some value for what they've discovered. Mm -hmm. So Sorry. my assumption, based off that, basically is uh, yeah, it's it's beneficial for the companies to run that. Yeah, Sammy, Sammy is really spot on in terms of providing a viable defense market is key to essentially. It's not necessarily that people will will you know choose from the highest bidder. That is such a myth. Um, you know, people will, will, you know, they'll, they'll do what they, they, they'll do what they think is necessary for themselves. If it's making a, a lot of money, they may seek, you know, an offense buyer. I hate calling it the black market because black market implies it's illegal. None of it's illegal. Um, and a lot of the supposedly black market is actually nation state buyers. So, you know, um, that's, still legal, will be legal for, for time immemorial, I'm going to guess. But the point is, um, providing that, that optional, you know, that option to sell into the defense market is absolutely key. Like how many people pirated music 
regular people pirating music until Apple iTunes made like 99 cents one click. Super easy to just get right. what you wanted Good and example. do the right thing. Yep. Yep. So take it out of the you know array of choices. Like, do I get paid or do I do the right thing? Just yep. make it the same choice. I get paid, or you know, a decent little amount or whatever. It's not the highest amount, but I do get paid, and I'm doing the right thing. Problem solved forever. And it's easier as well. I mean, selling, selling a, you know, unless you, you've got a cadence of selling stuff to offensive buyers, it's actually not that easy to do mm. for the first time. So yeah. you know, reducing, like having reduced friction around, uh, around getting paid is, is another you know, thing that I think we can, we can get better at and we'll start to shift the needle on this as we go forward. Now, so, um, uh, Sammy and Katie, you've been on the show before. You've answered these questions. Casey has not. So uh -oh. I want to oh, make no. sure, Casey, that you play five questions with Security Weekly. Are you ready? <laughs> All right. Here we go. Oh, I love it. Love it. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, tall, ranga, Australian. If you were a serial... What was the second word? Ranga, uh, ginger. It's, uh, ah, ranga. 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 Yeah. We need a ranga. translator. It's, like, it's an Aussie yeah. thing. Ranga. Hey, ranga. I, I can, I can help translate once in a while. I forgot to, I forgot to okay. roll the R on the end there. Casey, yeah. if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, uh, samurai sword. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, running with Scissors. In the, nice. in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Uh, second. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Oh, jeez. Um, uh, Morgan this Freeman. One, this is the one that trips him up. <laughs> yeah. no, okay. no, 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 no. He said Morgan, Morgan Freeman. Freeman. That's a great yeah. answer. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a good one. Um, and uh, Angelina Jolie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And she wins again. The most popular Proving yet again that most geeks have a mummy uh, problem. No, no, no. It has to, no, it has to be <laughs> that she was in Hackers. I think she's in Hackers. Yeah, yeah. That's what it's got to be. Yeah. Gotta be. Oh, oh, yeah. That's what it is. So, yes. yeah, yeah, Casey, it is. Just, just so you know, Casey, we're, we're all laughing because that's the most popular answer Hands to that down. question yeah. for Hands mom. So, the most so popular. Sneakers, sneakers was actually the movie that got me into hacking. Uh, hackers was the movie that got me. Yeah, we have a copy of the, uh, the I think it's the yeah, Sneakers the, DVD the right DVD over there. Right sneakers you know, DVD, it's actually yeah. the, Which is uh, kind of lame, actually. It should be the, the VHS yeah. tape. <laughs> it's the HD DVD back oh, there. You uh, see, this is HD DVD. Nice. Yeah, we don't muck about it. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Okay. Well, Casey, Sammy, and Katie, thank you very much for coming on the panel. It's wonderful having you. Uh, all three of you work really well together. Like, we should do this all the time. I think it's a yeah, great, this great dynamic between... Yeah. between I think we should. Well, and also, I didn't get to tell the story of how I met Sammy, which should be saved oh, oh, for another oh, podcast, because no, no, no. that's this a is, good we should story. Do Can okay. we do that so in, like a Dr. Seuss uh, uh, case? Uh, <laughs> 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 we can do that. Katie, you can do you it. You guys but, can just guess. Play Katie, five but the whole thing has Sammy. to rhyme. That's right. Yeah. No. Oh. No. no, I can sing it, but it doesn't. It can't rhyme. No, when I'm not Katie that good. Katie met Sammy. She lost her shoe. She didn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like green eggs and the ground. All right, yeah. All right. Katie. I, I, I'll tell you what. We'll let our imaginations run wild on that, and then we will come back. No, no, good no, reason. Wait, to bring wait, them wait, back. wait, wait. Read up. Sequel. Okay, now we're good. <laughs> 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 well, again, thank you all very much for coming on Security Weekly, and uh, we'll we'll see you all next time. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, With that, we're going to take a short Bye. break. We're going to bring on Ron Gula next, and we have a special guest in studio. Our surprise is here, so stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Woo! <laughs>